This talk is going to be about you and your career. So it's going to be very individually focused. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about me. And, um, and then I'm going to actually give you some tips and tools to take away. So I'm not going to do a talk that just lectures. But you're used to that at Globus of being interactive, right? Um, I'm going to do, I want you to, I'm going to ask you to do some things, either in partnerships, and I want you to walk away with a, not a career plan, but um, uh, how to build a network, and I'll explain all of this. So, um, so I just have to tell you, I, I um, heard um, Mr. Hori speak in Singapore a couple of years ago to the American Chamber of Commerce, and I really found that Globus was an incredible business school and really like the values and what Globus teaches. And I've, um, I did a little bit of work with Globus, not teaching, but doing some consulting work to, uh, that's how the Toshiba thing came about, in Singapore uh, in uh, diversity inclusion. All right, so let me tell you what, um, let me start off with my first question. Are careers serendipitous? Do they just happen? Or are they planned? What do you think? Both. 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 So um, I agree, but I, need to, I want to tell you what happened. I was going to give a talk in Australia to um, it was a group of about 400 women. And I really felt that we need to be more intentional about our careers. We need to tell our organizations what we want to do. Because our organizations are trying to keep talent and trying to get all of you to move ahead. So I was going to go on stage and say, you need to be intentional. And you know, we have to start talking about what we want, realizing that's a very American way to do things. Right? So the evening before, I was sitting at a fireside chat with the CEO for the conference. And this was the head of a fashion brand. And really charismatic leader, and she's talking, talking, talking about how she moved up and became the CEO of a giant fashion brand. And I'm thinking, gosh, how do you get that job? How do you become a CEO of a fashion brand? I'd like that job. And as I'm thinking that, someone in the audience says, how did you get that job? Now, this is CEO, right? And she's, I don't know. It just happened. <laughs> so I thought, I don't think so. I think we need to be more intentional. But I couldn't go on stage the next day and say you have to be intentional because this CEO is very popular. And I would have, my talk would have fell flat. So I started out by asking that question, are careers serendipitous, are they planned? So let me tell you a little bit about me and kind of circle back to that serendipity and plan. And I'm still not certain if serendipity always works, particularly if you have a goal to be a CEO. I don't think you just serendipitously arrive at being the CEO, do you? So, okay, so this is, um, this is me. Doesn't look like me. Uh, I have an American flag and a Chinese flag. Well, sort of, a combination. And if you wanted to, I could put a four-leaf a four clover up there. So my heritage is Irish. Uh, my grandfather came from Ireland. I have an Irish passport was not raised in Ireland. <laughs> I was raised in the US. Um, and so I grew up here. This is actually really where I grew up. This is Huntington Beach, California. Anybody spent time there? You have, Rico, at the pier. Do you surf? Uh, sail. Sail, OK. So I grew up doing exactly, you can kind of see that uh, picture of the people in the water. I actually grew up surfing. Uh, in Southern California. Before you go to school, that's what you would do, right? It became a sport at my high school. Um, and I went to graduate school in Northern California, and a lot of Japanese students were at this graduate school called the Monterey Institute of International Studies. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Had a big program between Japan and the United States. So I, I was in graduate school, and I was studying sp Spanish and international business. Growing up in Southern California, actually in Los Angeles, um, the most popular language is Spanish. And um, I actually always dreamed I wanted to be Mexican. <laughs> That's another story I have to tell you about. I would tell my mom, I want to grow up to be Mexican. <laughs> um, 
So I, I was, uh, so I really wanted to move to Spain, and I had a mentor uh, or guide at school, and he said, probably not going to get a job in Spain. It was in the late '80s, and um, it's what's happening right now in Spain, right? There weren't any jobs. So I'm walking past the admissions department, and there's a tiny, tiny little sign that says, "We're looking for volunteers to move to China." And I put my, I, I went into the office and said, I'd like, to, I'd like to move there. And they said, you don't speak Chinese. I said, I know that. And then they said, uh, and we're not looking for business students. We're looking for translation interpreters. We're looking for public policy people. So I talked my way into it. And I moved here. So I moved to Changsha, Hunan province. Did anybody spend time in China? Yeah. You're Chinese. And are you from Changsha? No. But you've been there. This is probably Guilin, but it's a nice picture, isn't it? <laughs> and are you from China also? Oh, Guangzhou. OK. You're from China. What part? Shanghai. Shanghai. OK. But you all know Changsha, right? And Changsha is known for? Heat? Heat, yes. Hot food, yes and where Mao was born. So there wasn't a whole lot going on when I moved to Changsha. I, I, um, I actually had to learn Chinese rather quickly. Uh, my Chinese is not very good. <laughs> I don't read or write. Uh, but, um, so, so that's serendipity. And that event changed my life forever. I moved, to, I moved back to the States for a little bit. Then I moved to Hong Kong. And I worked for a family-run company. Is anybody from Hong Kong here? God, you're from all over. Like Huntington Beach, China. Is anybody from Hong Kong? So I worked for a Hong Kong family-run company, and then I went to work for some big iconic brands. And then actually in teaching, doing leadership development, I found that why do, I wanted to know why do some people get ahead and some people don't. And I went back to school and studied leadership. And I found some very interesting things about leadership. And I specifically looked at Asian leadership, uh, Asia, uh, Asian talent. And I specifically looked at women. So I'm going to bring some of those things into this conversation. Because what I learned in that process of learning leadership, I learned a lot about what we're going to talk about tonight is careers. Actually, I learned more about careers than I did on leadership. But I managed to get my degree. So that was a good thing. So here's what the talk's going to look at. I'm going to talk about um, a career model, what you, what you should look at when you're looking, about, looking at careers, a uh, really simple model. I also want to talk about your career story. Uh, I want to, I want to d refute the myth of self-promotion, which again is a, I would say it's a very American term, um, and, but move it towards how do you tell your story and why that's so important. Uh, and then I, this is the piece I want to end with. I want to end on having you think about how do you build a network to get where you want to be. <coughs> If you want a global career, who do you need to have in that network? What does it look like? So I mentioned the word network. Do you like that term? Yeah? What does it mean when I say network? <laughs> Connecting with people, yeah. So I, yeah, connect, making connections, building relationships. So sometimes when I say that word network, people think, oh, handing out business cards. So I'm not going to talk about that, but I am going to talk about who you should have in your network if you want to build a global career. That's why you're all here tonight, right? Here's my career, not my career model. I found this one, right? So what I focus on is right here. I focus on aspirations. That's the, the, a lot of the work that I do. And how do you, let me just ask you, how many times, you're all students, so you might do this, but how many times during the week do you think about your career? <coughs> Reflect on it. A number of times? No, I mean, just do you, weekly. Weekly you think about it. And what do you think about? I'm trying to Where are you gonna go next? And do you know exactly what you wanna do? Okay, good, good. 
Others think about it frequently. I think it's because you're students. <laughs> because mostly when I ask this question, people go, oh, I never think about it. <laughs> I haven't thought about it till today, right? So um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, actually it's a good thing to do because it gets back to that serendipity versus planned, right? So I work in, this, in the aspirations. I'm going to explain this to you why I think this is how this kind of works. So I try to help people figure out what it is they want to do. And then um, when you think about what you want to do, do you have the skills? I, I don't work on skill development, and this talk's not about skill development, but, but you have to think, do I have the skills to match that, right? And then, what's the macro condition? And when I say macro conditions, I mean what's happening inside your firm right now, or what's happening in the economy right now. So um, I'll give you an example of this. Is anybody here from Barclays? Does anybody work at Barclays? Good, because I'm going to talk about Barclays. <laughs> Not in a bad way. I'm just going to share a story. I'm going to use Barclays as an example. Um, so say I work at Barclays, and I, my goal is to be the head of technology in the investment banking world. That's what I want to do. I, do. Do I have the skills? Absolutely. I've studied technology. I've studied STEM. I've got it. Um, have I managed people? Probably small teams. Not enough. So I probably need to get some more abilities in that area. What's the macro conditions like? Mm. Barclays just announced uh, all technology is going to go to Poland or India. And I say, for example, I live in Japan. Oh, do I want to move to Poland? Do I speak Polish? Do I, want to, do I want to move to India? So you have to make those decisions, right? Do you want to stay here and have a global career, or do you want to go someplace else? Now the next macro condition. What, ju what just happened last week with the new CEO of Barclays? What did they decide? Do you study investment banks, sir? The new CEO of Barclays just announced he's going to cut investment banking all across Asia. So if that's my goal, that I want to be the chief head of technology, both internally, it's moved, and the macro conditions have changed. So I have to be aware of that, right? So that's what I'm saying to you. You can have all the aspirations if you want to be CEO or head of this, but you have to look at what's happening in the macro conditions. And you have to be kind of aware of that and be adaptable to it. So let me ask you this, since you already answered it. What is it, if I asked you, what is it that you really, really want to do with your career job? Could you answer that? You could. No. Others? Yes. Do you want to share? What would yours be? <laughs> Sorry, my name is Daniel. Uh, MBA candidate here at Globis. I, my, what I really want to do in my job is to acquire skills that will help me in the future to actually affect my kokorozashi, as in my personal mission in life. Your personal mission is? My personal mission in life is to uh, create technological related education, to oh. bridge gap between uh, technical skills and companies, because innovative technologies in companies, there's a gap within universities and organizations. So. I think if I do any job, it will be anything that will support my mission in life. Thank Great. You. So you've got that down. Very good. I have to thank him for standing up. <laughs> you said you know what you want to do. Uh, nice. It's to help develop more leaders. To help develop more leaders. Yes. Here in Japan. Well, globally. Globally. Globally, yes. But based out of here. No, I'm actually based from Manila. OK. So, OK, great. Yes. Great. This is, um, sorry, a little side path here. Uh, when I was studying leadership, I think this is probably one of the most important things that needs to be done across Asia. So uh, it's, and actually it's really timely. Organizations are all looking for this. How do we build global talent? How do we grow lo local leaders here, whatever country you pick, to, to work globally? The reason why I ask this question is this. I'm often, uh, I'm often called into work with, I do a lot of work with women, 
I also work with men, but my thesis was on women. So I do a lot of work with women. And what I can say is all of your organizations, whether they be Japanese multinationals or other multinationals, are really trying to build this diverse and inclusive work environment. And so I'm often brought, brought in to coach women <clears throat> to the next level. So if you're looking, does anybody work at a bank here? Yeah. Okay. So you know the levels of like vice president, ED up to managing director. So I typically work at the VP, ED level, so next level down. And organizations want women to move into these managing director roles. And when I get to the coaching engagement, here's what I hear. I'm so glad you're here. I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> now, this is a problem for me because I've been hired by their company to get them to stay, not to get them to leave. So I'll say, well, what is it that you really want to do? What do you think the answer is? They don't know. They don't know, right? So uh, either I don't know, I haven't thought about it, or I'm thinking of building an app that helps us be more efficient. I'm thinking about opening up a coffee shop that has from local growers or I'm thinking about eradicating poverty. Really great ideas, right? Okay, so you want to do that. And then have you done a feasibility study or mapped out that plan? No. So what so this is this is this is the work that I found with a lot of organizations. They really want to know what you want to do, and you need to be able to articulate what you want to do, but you have to do it in your own style, right? So um, so Here's how you find this out, that question of what I really, really want to do. And it's what's really beautiful about Globus is you're already doing this. So Globus has, is really based on, from what I read, really based on values and your mission statement. Like you had a mission statement and a vision statement, right? So do you go through that in your MBA program? Yep. So you, do you come to the program trying to formulate that, or how does that work? You're going to run. Oh. Do you do it during the program that you yeah. figure out mission mission? OK. And so where are you now? Are you all at different levels? Does anybody feel comfortable that you have a vision and a mission? Not yet. You will. When you leave tonight, you will have one. Um, <laughs> so why, um, why I'm actually really delighted to be here is the, the work that Globus does is the work that I feel is, uh, is a lot of the work that I do in careers. And I think it's crit critically important. And I wish a lot of uh, business schools would really focus on this. What you, need to, what you need to do to find out what it is you really want to do is you match your values. So you figure out what are your values. Then you figure out what are your strengths. And then you figure out what your interests are. And it's at that intersection of that point that you're going to figure out, oh, this is what I really want to do. This is it. So uh, in my research uh, uh, with women, I found that um, there were a lot of the women I interviewed uh, were, so I asked a question. I'll tell you the question I asked. So I, I'm an ethnographer. I, I, I literally followed and interviewed women for three to four years. I'm not a quantitative researcher. I just do my research through storytelling. So I ask, but oh, what are your values? Who are the early influences of your life? And there was one question I asked that led me to where I am today. So the question was, um, tell me about a time that you failed. Now, these were women in Asia from, like I said, Australia, Bangladesh, all the way up to Japan, India. When I ask that question, what do you think the response is? So tell me about a time that you failed. Never? Yes. Um, go ahead, say Okay, um, I thought never, because we never had a chance to challenge anything, so we never failed. Um, it was the first part. We never, I've never failed at anything, but they didn't say the second part. But yeah, you're right. I never failed at anything. Yeah, oh, one more. We have one more in the back here. 
Sorry, I'm making you run. I didn't know. <laughs> Hi. Um, I think another uh, reason why we say never is we're not brave enough. Women are perfectionism in themselves. We are expected to be perfect and not fail. So a lot of girls and women, we, we're, we don't dare to try. Oh, now that's interesting. So um, I do think perfectionism is something we should not do. I think you're, you've, you've got to be the best, right? But I think, and I think we should get over perfection. Sometimes perfectionism can lead to procrastination, right? Or lead to, but it, what, it, was, it was either complete silence or I've never failed at anything. So let me take a step back and talk a little bit about cultural, cultural side of this. Um, I think your response is interesting, though. Um, and I'm going to tell you a story, another theme that I found with women that might, that might get us to think a little bit differently. So um, if you think about that question that I asked, and I've lived in Asia for over 20 years, and I studied cultures, and I studied Chinese, right? And I had to read philosophy books all the, before I went to China. That question is very American-centric. right? Tell me about a time that you failed. It's based on Howard Gardner's work leading minds, and he found that, and he studied this leaders around the world, he found that everyone had, had overcome a setback. It wasn't that they hadn't failed, it was the wrong way of asking that question. So that was my learning on it. Um, but here's, the, here's the, the problem I had. I had three years of research, three years of interviews with six different women and I couldn't write their story because I really put a lot of focus on that failure. So I didn't know what to do. I, I really, at that point, I was going to give up my dissertation going, what did I do? I mean, I just, you know. So I took a step back and thought about it. And um, one, that question is very viable if you're in the US and if, particularly if you're in Silicon Valley. People talk about failures all the time. Oh, I failed 50 times. Lost a lot of money. I failed. So it's kind of, so it's very American-centric. Um, so what I did is I looked at their lives, and I started looking back on their lives, and it wasn't necessarily failure, but there were some setbacks, there were some things that happened in their lives that led them to be the leaders they are today. So one woman, um, <clears throat> uh, one woman at a very young age, Singaporean woman, her father died. That wasn't a failure, that something happened. And she was catapulted to a leadership position in her family. Mother of five, running a multi-billion dollar uh, high-tech company, working for a high-tech company, and, um, and was really pushed a lot by her mom to succeed. Another, uh, another woman, a Japanese woman, who was raised here and uh, was an architect and then went out to, to start a lot of uh, restaurants. She was a chef, she loved to cook. And in the middle of a successful run of restaurants, she developed a disease on her hands and she couldn't cook anymore. And at that point, this was a, a huge event for her, she decided to start an NGO because her whole goal in life was to help people and eradicate poverty, right? So when I started looking back on their lives, I saw these events that happened in their lives that led them to be where they are today. So back to values, strengths, and interests. If all of you look back on your life and think, what were the pivotal events that got me where I am today? Why I'm at Globus today? Map that against values and interests and strengths. You actually have what's meaningful for you. You have, uh, you can get insights from that, th those, um, those looking back. You know Steve Jobs, right? Did you see his Stanford speech? Stay foolish, stay hungry, right? So that speech is a great speech, but what's more, it makes that speech really powerful. Steve Jobs looked back on his life, and he had a fascination with. Anybody heard the speech? Do you remember he was, what he was fascinated with? Was, uh, so he was adopted, and his parents, they, they, basically, when he was adopted, he, he was, sorry, thank you. So I believe the story was that uh, when he was adopted, his adopted, adopting parents promised that he would go to university. 
and, and then so he felt that he needed to go to university to fulfill that promise, but when he went there, he felt that that wasn't the right place for him and it was costing a lot of money that his adoptive parents couldn't afford. Yep, that's part of it. And, and here's the he, rest. And what? <laughs> and what did he? Do, what was he fascinated with at that university? Do you remember what he was really fascinated with? What? Calligraphy. Yes, calligraphy and fonts. So, and when he looked back on his life, what he realized is that that focus on calligraphy and fonts led him to what he did with Apple. Right? All of you have these events in your lives too. You just need to stop and look at it. Um, you need to look back on what had meaning, what were the setbacks, how did you overcome them, how do they match with values and strengths and interests. If any of you are stuck, even though you're in an MBA program, and, and typically when you go to an MBA program, you're doing it to advance your career, right? So, so if you, it, when you graduate and you think, well, what am I gonna do? Take some time to reflect on this uh, about what it is and, and, and what you want to do. After you do that, here's my next one. So there's a, there's a whole lot of, of, of um, discussion in the media about how you have to stand up and say, talk about what you do, right? Self-promotion, right? Do you like that term, self-promotion? Kind of cringeworthy, right? I see people in the just going, ah, I'm not so certain. Some people might say it's okay. So we, so I, I wrote a book, and it's here. It's called I Wish I'd Known That Earlier in My Career, and I write about self-promotion. And I do think we need to, in these global workforces, you've got to tell people what you do. You've got to, uh, they need to know who you are and what you do. But I actually wish I could take that uh, piece out of my book because it, it, it's really hard. It doesn't necessarily work across cultures and it doesn't necessarily work globally with gender. So women have a tendency not to really talk about their achievements, right? Um, so I firmly believe that you do it through telling a story. If you have a great story to tell, it's much easier than self-promotion. But storytelling is harder than self-promotion because you have to learn how to tell stories, right? Do you do any storytelling at, at Globus? Do you teach storytelling at Globus for leadership? Well, I think you should. <laughs> Mark that down. Tell Mr. Horry. Um, so um, here's why. There's a beautiful book, uh, oh, I'm gonna forget the book, no. It's called The Story Factor. It's written by a woman named Annette Simmons. She also wrote a book on politics, which is interesting. And in that book, she says there's six stories. I'm gonna tell you the top three, because I think it definitely relates to, who, to where we are today. There's three stories that every leader needs to know how to tell. And I think this is a really important distinction. You need to learn how to tell a story. The first one is, who am I? So if we go back to this, who am I is your values, right? The second one is, what's my, why am I here? Why am I here at Globus? Why am I here at Goldman Sachs? Why am I here at JP Morgan? Why am I here at whatever company you work for? Why am I here? What do I deliver? What's my, what am I, what's my impact on the organization? And the last story is, what's my vision? Isn't that very much connected to Globus, right? What's my vision? Now for what's my vision, that's a big one, isn't it? Have you thought about your personal vision? Oh wait, some of you have thought about your personal vision. <laughs> so um, I think that's a big ask. But if you break it down, if you're running a team or if you, if you break it down to careers, it's what's my career vision or for my team? What's my vision for my team? So break it, break it down. So those are the three st stories you need to learn how to tell. And telling a story, what makes a great story? What, what are some things in a story that make it great? Problem. Drama? A problem. a problem, yes. And? 
relevance to the listener. If, if they can learn something for, from it and can relate to it and can be better off having heard it. Yep. So connection with the audience, yeah. I was going to say that um, you have characters who you can relate to personally, and you feel some kind of emotional connection to them. Absolutely, absolutely. And when you were all growing up, did you watch Disney stories? Some? There's a pattern of stories. It's a little bit like you were talking about. There's context. Context, so uh, I started out with context. I was born in Huntington Beach, and then I moved to Chung, so that's the context, right? Um, there's themes, so sometimes a theme could be a value, or sometimes it could be what you do, right? Context theme, and overcoming a challenge, overcoming a barrier. Those are the types of stories that people relate, and if you connect to an audience, like, um, so that's, that's, that's what I'm suggesting that you need to do. Now what I want you to do is this. I want you to think about, I'll give you a couple minutes to do this, is, um, Three words that would describe you. Just write down three words that would describe you. Now I want you to do, and this is gonna be maybe a little bit uncomfortable, I want you to turn to the person next to you, hopefully you know them, and share your words. <laughs> Okay, now come back. Um, so that's just, the reason why I start this way is that's just sort of start of your storytelling, right? To think about three, so storytelling takes a bit of time, but think about three words that describe you. Think about, like you were saying, the audience, who are you speaking to? I didn't give you that part, so that's not fair. Um, think about how that links to maybe perhaps your career and the impact you have on the organization. And then think about it from this perspective. These, you know, say I had creative thinking uh, and diversity and inclusion. So because I'm a creative thinker and I am work in diversity and inclusion, I can bring together a pretty diver a diverse team and provide some innovative solutions for the organization. So because of this, I can do this. So it's like you were saying earlier, your story needs to think about the other person. So it is about you, but what is the impact on the organization? And this is what makes it different than self-promotion, right? And, and the power of storytelling, so a little disclosure on me, I actually used to teach storytelling at the Walt Disney Company. Now can you imagine me going into a group of executives that are like, you, you're gonna teach us storytelling? We are the best at storytelling, right? <laughs> So, but at least some leadership, they, they needed to learn this. They needed to, be, so storytelling is powerful because you lean in and listen. Like, the, even though I told you to share and you were sharing, but there's a different energy in the room when you listen to somebody else's story, you listen to their words, right? You learn, actually up here I saw people giving somebody a word. Now this is what you do, right? So you, it's inclusive, it's incredibly powerful, and you've all learned through stories since you've been this little. Teachers, if you're religious, religious organizations, this is how we learn. So I'm gonna, now I'm going to take it one step further, and I'm going to I'm going to end on I'm going to I'm going to talk about your network and get you to think about a network. And I, I want to end on this piece, and then we're going to open it up for questions. This is the piece to me that is incredibly important for your careers, and and whether you whether you want to stay in Japan or you want to have a global career, it's really important. It is what you know, because you have to be smart and deliver on results, but it also is there's a connection to that network that's gonna support you. It's also very important for both men and women to provide balance. Do you work a lot of hours in your jobs? Yes. Is it hard to find balance? Yes. So your network will help you find balance. So I'm gonna bring in three pieces of research. I'm gonna bring in research that I did with women in Asia, research from North America, research from France on this piece. So how important, and I'm gonna give you a number, one not important, five really important. How important is a network, having a network of connections to achieving your goals? One, nothing, five, yes. What would you say? 
five, five, five. We could have a ripple effect. So maybe if you want to say something different, you can. Four. <laughs> so this was research from um, Ermina Ibarra. She writes a lot on careers and leadership. You might have read her work. And she asked the same question to CEOs. And they answered the same way you did, four to five. So now let's look at, now I'm going to have you analyze your network. So the next one is I want you to write down 10 pe the names of 10 people or initials, it's ever easier for you, of who you have reached out to or reach out to constantly in the past week or month. Somebody you connect with all the time, 10 people. Just write them down. And then we're going to analyze your network. And it could be family, too. You, yeah, you should include family in this, too. And this is about you reach out to these people for your careers or business or work life. Was it easy to pick 10? No. No. More or less? How many? One? <laughs> I could get 10, but it was a struggle. And eight of them I already work with, so I don't know if that's really good. I need a better network. Well, <laughs> so now we're going to analyze it. So it's good. you got to 10. So if you didn't get to 10, you need to decide on your network. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about what the research indicates on network. Typically, it's about 10 to 12 people, solid group of network connections. Um, now we're going to analyze it, right? Um, so in my research with women, what I found that sustained success and provided, well, balance was every single one of them said they had a, a network of advisors. As a matter of fact, one woman, the woman I think I mentioned who was running a technology company, had five children, she actually had a beautiful name for it. It was called Web of Inclusion. Like, how powerful is that? I, I wish I could have marketed that. I think it's just, a, I like that word better than networks, right? Web of Inclusion. This word, though, comes from Sally Hegelson's work in the late 1990s when she was looking at women CEOs. And what, what it is, it, what I found in Asia is women have strong connections that provide support, and that those connections also include uh, uh, families. Uh, but uh, what am I trying to say? Uh, a, broad, a broad definition of families. So it could be in Singapore, Hong Kong, India, lots of countries in Southeast Asia. It could be help. Having a nanny at home is also family for them. It could be father-in-law, mother-in-law, right? So uh, it could be aunties and uncles. So that support network is really important. As a matter of fact, if it was out of balance, then they were out of balance. So I'm going to show you what I found with them that uh, what the, uh, the people you need to have in your network, and I'm going to link it back to my research and other research. So I want you to build a web of advisors. If you didn't think of 10, you may want to include, you may want to think uh, when you leave here, oh, better add more people to my network, particularly if I want a global career. And then I'm going to talk about, um, oops, that's the wrong, oh, sorry, let me go back. Okay, so now what I want you to do is when you think about your network, I'm going to give you some categories to think about. And you can map them against your 10 names or your five names, right? In your network, you need to have a knowledge expert. So if, uh, if I'm in diversity and inclusion, I need to connect with Suzanne because she's an expert in diversity and inclusion. So Suzanne should be in my network, right? I'm just going to use um, so that's where I, I can, we share knowledge. We go out to people to get, um, if you want to be in leadership development, maybe you want to connect with both of us. <laughs> so um, so we, we have these expertise, right? So you need a knowledge expert. And I'm not just saying one. You can have several if you feel like it. The next one is you need a savvy advisor. And I'm talking about political savvy advisor. This is the person that says to you when you decide oh, I um, want to uh, uh, 
build a new technology platform and here it's going to cost us $5 million and here's why. Someone pulls you aside and says, uh, now is not the time. This other division just put in a PO and theirs is $3.5 million. You going in at $5 million, mm, probably not going to fly. So someone who gives you advice as to what's going on, right? The third one is either a problem solver, somebody who challenges your wacky, crazy ideas, like you think, oh, I want to open up a, I want to, I want to open up a, a leadership institute inside my firm, and, and someone will say, really, is this the best time to do it? Or tell me a little bit more about that. It's either someone who challenges you or a mentor. Do you all have mentors? You should get one. They're good. Informal, formal. You don't need to have the big formal net. You know, I give a lot of talks and people say, we don't have a mentoring program at my work. <laughs> it's actually OK. Just call somebody who you think could be a mentor for you. Do it yourself, right? I know that's also not easier said than done. Ment problem solver. Uh, Mentor, political savvy, knowledge expert, connector. Find people who are the connectors inside your, inside your company. And what I mean by connector is that person that everybody goes to. That person that you think, I need to find out where the uh, party is this weekend. I'll go to so-and-so. I need to find out what happened at that last event. Go to so-and-so. It's that person that they always give that name. You know, go to Fred. Fred knows it all. And Fred's connecting with everybody, right? Does that make sense, Connector? It was, this is Malcolm Gladwell's book, Tipping Point, right? They're very powerful people. And what's powerful about connectors is they're really, they, they, connect, they connect with people and they connect other people because they want to. There's no agenda there. Typically, they just want to connect you. So have a connector in your network. And particularly if you're more prone to introversion and you don't like to talk to people, you just need one connector. Very powerful. The other two are from my research and another piece of research. Find, um, find somebody who gives you energy. So when you're having a really bad, awful day and you think, I don't want to do this anymore, I, I don't care how, I don't care, I'm, I'm going to quit, who do you call that gives you energy? And the last one is the well is the balance piece. When you're working to 11 or 12 or 1 o'clock at night, who calls you to say, hey, let's go have a cup of coffee, let's have a drink of wine, let's go see a movie, let's just come, come back early. So all those categories that I just said, can you map those 10 people to those categories? You can? Oh, good. You get the star. No, it was just. <laughs> Can you tell us the last one? What do you call the last one? Well being or balance. Well -being. Yeah. Sorry. Do you have all those down? Yep. OK. Knowledge expert, savvy expert, or political savvy. Problem solver, mentor, connector, energy, and balance, well-being balance. There's a great piece of research on this from the University of Virginia. His name is Rob Cross, if you want to learn more on this. There's another out of the University of Chicago, Ron Burt. They've been studying networks for years, 20 years, way before the internet. And what they found was this is where you get innovative ideas. If you have a very diverse network and you've got these different groups in there, you're going to get more innovative ideas. Right? That's where the intersection of innovation comes in. So they look, at, they look at networks inside organizations, but you can also look about it for your careers. But I want to just give you a piece on this network bit. Is, um, what they also found is people who are the most connected, those centrally connected people, like the person who knows everything, are your high performers inside organizations. So there's a powerful component with that that, some, that organizations are now looking at this from a talent perspective. Where are my connectors inside the organization? They have a tendency to be high performers. 
I'm going to wrap this up because I want you to measure your network and then we're going to close. So now that you have your 10 people and all those, here's how you measure it. And I'm going to ask you again to weigh the value of your network. Does everybody in your network look the same? And what I mean by that, are uh, I worked with a young uh, manager, actually a director at Disney who was rolling out a leadership development new program, right? And he said, everybody that I'm talking to is on my level or below. Not a lot of diversity there, right? So when I, I, you need to have, so what you need to have is breadth, and that is, are they not just your level, not just your function, not just Japan, not just your organization? Where's, do you have the diversity? When I say diversity, I'm not just talking about gender and culture. I'm talking about the big D of diversity. So get the breadth in your network. Um, and particularly if you want to go for a global career. Say you want to be in Japan, you work in, it in Japan, but maybe your organization has launched, rolled out in Indonesia and India and China or someplace else, and you want to go there. That breadth is important for you to have. The next one is connectivity. And that is, is everybody in your network connected to everybody else? If it is, it's not the best thing because they only remember you for who you are now. So for me, I was uh, organizational development, talent, leadership, and I stepped out of that space and moved into diversity inclusion. If I didn't, ha if I didn't have a broader network or different connections, I would have still been seen as the Disney leadership development person. So you got so to make certain that not everybody is connected. You need diverse connections. The final one is for you to think about your careers. So if you want to go into leadership development and you want to go into technology and education and bridge the gap, who do you know that's doing that now? That person should be in your network. Even if you don't decide not to go there, how do I think about that? How do I, how do I find out about that job? You know what, maybe I don't even want that job after I talk to that person. So that's the dynamic part on it. Get somebody who you want to be like or the job you want to go to and have that person in your network. That person could be a mentor, could be a knowledge expert, could be a savvy advisor. Now what I want you to do is measure your network again. And from this perspective, on those names, those categories, would you say my network is five, excellent value, will definitely help my career, or, yeah, it's kind of limited. What number would you put on it? Two. Two? two? Do we have any higher than two? 2.5. 2 2.5. There we go. Two, it's like an auction. 2.5. <laughs> the same question that I asked you in the beginning on how value is a network to your goals, and you said four to five, or mostly five, you said four. This is the exact same question that Ermina Ibarra asked those same CEOs. They were a little bit higher than you, but they weren't that high. They said three to four. After they went through this process of looking at their networks, yeah, maybe about three, I could improve it. So I'm going to wrap up and tell you why I believe this is so important. Um, and it's a little bit of a story about me. Uh, I'd been in Asia for a long time, and um, I um, was at Disney and loved my job at Disney. But it was one of those times where it happens to everybody. I was in the back of the Disneyland Hotel. It was at a strategy session. It was really great. And I said to myself, I don't want to do this anymore. I need to do something different, right? It wasn't the company, it was more me. So I had two job offers. One was in India and one was in Japan. And I took the one, sorry, not Japan, I'm here. <laughs> two job offers, one in India, one in Singapore. And I took the one in Singapore. Great job uh, doing some similar things I was doing. So I wasn't really challenged, to be honest with you. I was like, oh, it's different company, same, same role. Within three months, I lost my job. Financial crisis, my job was made redundant. And um, I actually didn't know what I was going to do, right? So that whole question of meaning, what's meaningful, I had to answer pretty quickly. This network saved my life. 
So I was in Singapore, didn't know anybody, um, had to quickly decide on what I wanted to do, and then I had to quickly build a network to make that happen, right? So I, I feel it's, I've seen it work with other people in their careers. I think it's incredibly powerful. You all need this type of support. Um, I reached out to two women the day that I found out that my job was no longer. I didn't even know them very well and said, I don't have a job. What do I do? And they said, come over and talk to us oh, separately. Come over here. What do you want to do? And I got two consulting assignments that day. So serendipitous. It was wonderful. It happened. But I think these networks are incredibly important, and particularly if you want to build a global career. So I want to ask you one question. And then I'm going to end. What's the one thing that you can do today that will positively impact your career tomorrow? What would you say? Who wants to volunteer? And behind too. Maybe to know to be a friend, uh, all of them in this room, and to build a network. <laughs> that's a good one to bi build a network with everybody sitting in this room. And actually, that's an important one because one of the most powerful network groups are alumni groups, right? Either from your university setting, your undergrad where you went to school, or uh, business. So good. So you're gonna you're gonna start that up, right? <laughs> Anybody want to add one more action that you would take? It could be simple. Have a plan um, so that you know you have you know specific maybe milestones or points of action that you want to take, and be really intentional about it. Yeah. And that, that's, that's a great one, is have a plan, have an adaptable plan, because you never know what might happen. And I'm going to circle back to the very beginning story that I told you about the woman who was the CEO, right? And it just happened. Oh, it just happened. I became the CEO of the, the... Do you think that was true? So I actually did research on her to find out. Um, a little, a little sleuth move, I Googled and found out. Anyway, her mother was a big, big, very involved in the fashion industry, and her mother was the one who pushed her and made all the, made all the connections for her so she could be who she is today to see. So it doesn't just happen serendipitously. You do need to have a plan, so good. That's the end of my talk. I'm going to thank you for your participation, and now we're going to have a discussion and more questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, so usually we would begin with me asking Jane lots of questions. And believe me, I've taken lots of notes and I've got tons of questions. <laughs> um, however, I think that, that what Jane's just done is actually quite personal. And I'm guessing that there's lots of questions that you're all itching to ask. So before I ask mine and take the conversation in some other directions, I'd like to open up first of all to the floor and ask, what are your questions? Anybody have something that you're itching to ask? Yes. Hi. Um, so you said when you're in Singapore, you made a lot of connections to survive in Singapore. And then I'm thinking to start something new outside of Tokyo. And let's say I want to make a connection. Would you make a connection in Tokyo? Or you know, after I move to a different place, I should make a you know, connection like close to me, like where I live? Or did you make a connection on like a Facebook? or? I want to know exactly what connection is like. Okay. Does it have to be close or? Yeah. So if I get this right, you're thinking about yeah. moving to Singapore, moving. I, or starting I, a business or something there, right? Yeah. I I got married. I'm moving outside of Tokyo, which is very you know very countryside. But I want to do something in that area. 
for people living in that area. So what if I make a connection in Tokyo and then connection will help my business, I think. But do I have to make connection in the area I live or do I have to make connection like right now? Like, yeah. Um, I, I, I um, think if you know where you want to go uh, and, and what you want to do, so say if you want to move to Singapore, I would start making connections now in Singapore. But I also wouldn't, I wouldn't discount where you are now if you're in Japan. I think you also need a solid network here. So it's, I, I would do both, yeah, if I understand that right. So are you planning a move there or? I already, yeah, I am planning to move. You, to you're planning, to, you haven't yeah, moved there yeah, yet. Yeah. I would yeah. definitely make those connections now then, yeah. 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 Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Can I add something to that? Because I've also you know, lived and worked in various countries, and what I've found is some of the connections that I make initially might not be the connections that I continue leveraging yeah. later on, but they lead to other connections. Yeah. So remember that you know, the connections kind of fan out. Absolutely, yep, yep, question. Hi, thank you for the um, insightful speech. Um, my question is, um, after hearing this, it reminds me of our, uh, one of our classes that here where we talked about um, the famous book, um, How to Win Friends and Influence oh, People. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering what, um, how do you draw the line? Because in that class, it, um, a lot of people actually criticized the book oh, really? for being too goal-oriented. Mm. You're not actually making friends, but you're, you're actually going for a goal. So, what, how do you define that line? I think that's a great question. And it's also, um, I forgot to add that part, so I think it's really important. Um, a lot of times, Suzanne and I sometimes are at similar conferences. So, there's a conference, uh, so I was speaking at a conference and, um, in, 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 uh, to, to w women and in Europe. And um, we were doing this whole thing on networks. This is way before I was doing this. It was a different networking thing. And um, all the people in the room, there were a lot of them, decided they were just going to call their CEO tomorrow and tell them what they wanted, right? It's like, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> so um, if you've read Adam Grant's book on give and take, one of the most important things that you can do with this network thing, and I think we've mm -hmm. all had this experience, is what are you giving, right? Mm -hmm. It's a give and take. It's very old philosophy. It becomes actually from Asia about uh, I, I'm going to give you something, and then maybe in a couple weeks I might ask for a favor in return. And I'll, I'll make a giving example of that. Um, I did some work with Hong Kong University doing research on gender, and the project ended. But I really want to stay connected with them. It's a great university. So I found a piece of research last week. And I sent it to, the, to one of the researchers there to say, look, I know you're doing research in this area. I think you might like this article. It's about 700 pages, but I think you might like it. <laughs> um, and, and it rekindled the connection, right? So don't, so I think you made a very important point. It's not always about you. I know I talk about your career, mm -hmm. but you've got to, it's got to be that give and take. Otherwise, it gets, do you ever have somebody who calls you and always asks for a connection? Do you have any of that happens to you? To be introduced to people or make connections? Yeah? How does that make you feel? Sometimes I feel kind of used. <laughs> yeah, exactly, perfect. Sometimes you feel like, oh, is that all you're calling me? So, yeah, glad you brought that up. Thank you. I haven't read that book in a long time. <laughs> any other questions anyone's burning to ask? Okay, then I guess I'll, I'll step into some of my questions. And oh, uh, we did have someone, sorry. Oh, no. No? Oh. We're returning the microphone. <laughs> so let me launch into a few of my questions. And um, if anybody has questions in between, please feel free to put up your hand. And of course, I'll give you more time to ask questions later. Um, what I'd like to ask, first of all, is you know, people here at Globus, I think some people working in domestic firms or going to be, some people working in global firms. Do you think there's anything different when it comes to navigating your career in a global company versus a domestic one? Um, I do. Um, and I think the difference is um, 
it's understanding that broad perspective of a network, but more importantly, it's understanding the cross-cultural differences. Mm -hmm. I think when you're navigating across cultures, it's very different, and particularly when you talk about political savvy advisors and things like that. Politics uh, uh, inside organizations are different across cultures and different across organizations. I think you have to be savvy about the culture, crossing cultures, and, and a, an awareness and a knowledge of that. Um, so I think that's the difference between just navigating your home country versus navigating globally. Mm -hmm. And how can people get that? apart from attending a course at Globus. <laughs> I don't use your time. Um, mm. I don't, um, well, uh, cross-cultural awareness brings, with, brings it starts with self-awareness, right? So, and actually it's really fabulous to move outside your home country because you are confronted with your own values and who you are in a very, very abrupt manner. Um, so I think uh, one, self-awareness, you, do you learn that at Globus Cross Cultural? Do you learn cross cultural awareness here, cross cultural leadership? Yes. Yes. Um, so here, um, so having that awareness, uh, and then also just um, just going out and doing it and um, making some mistakes and asking for some advice. My husband. Okay, I'll tell you a story. My husband is with me, tonight, and he went to a restaurant with a friend here, Japanese friend. And in Hong Kong, when you get chopsticks, and when you pull them out, would you do this, right? But his friend said, oh, don't do that here. You have to do it more discreetly here. So even, I don't know if that's the truth, but that's in a sense he learned at that minute, you know, mm -hmm. what, was, what was okay in Hong Kong, but not okay here. Okay, thank you. Um, and also, You've talked quite a bit about sort of owning your career or thinking about what you're interested in, what your strengths are, and so on. Um, quite often in Japan, some of the Japanese models are um, a rotational system yeah. where every year, every two years, I mean, think often April the 1st, isn't it's the time when lots of people <laughs> get shuffled into a different department or to head up the business in a different country. And hopefully there was some kind of plan in mind of where where has somebody else decided you aspire to get to yeah. and what would be the steps to get there? But what would be, what do you think about that and what would be your advice for somebody that finds themselves somewhat not having as much control as they might like over what happens next in their career? Yeah, I think there's two, two, two recommendations I would have for that. Is one is, besides Japanese firms, there's also some big global banks like HSBC and a couple others who had management training programs and every two years you would move, mm -hmm. you know, you go to this country, this country, this country, and, and to stay on that management track you had to follow it. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's, I think there's one, if that's what you're on, the track that you're on, you can, a lot of the stuff that I talked about here, strengths, interests, values, you can actually do that on your job, the job that you have now, and look at that and see where you're getting fulfillment and, um, and craft the job that you want, knowing that you're gonna change. So I think there's a way that you can have the job that you want, even though it's more planful. Um, and it's, it's breaking this down into more manageable steps. That's one. The second thing is, I think there's a, sh it's, I don't know about Japan, uh, but it, there's a shift away from that planning and it's that same bank that I told you that moves people around has actually, I'm working with, to get people to own their careers. And they want to hear from you what you want to do. So one, I think you can manage it, but the second one I think is more what's happening inside firms right now, that they want you to own it and you to determine where you're going and, um, and find meaning. Sometimes those firms that have the planful ones, I work with a lot of people who've decided, I don't really want to do this anymore. And it's, it's very, it's torn between this is my path and it's, it could be quite lucrative, but that's not me. So. Mm. It's interesting. Also, some of the, uh, the people that I'm coaching who are in leadership roles or their high potential or talent in particularly some Japanese organizations, interestingly, just lately, they've been told this is what you're moving to next and they've said, no, I'm not. And it's been a bit of a shock, you know, for leadership that, that they're pushing back like this and they're saying, you think this is where I want to get to. Actually, I'm thinking something different or here's an interest I've got that you don't know yeah. I've got. And if you don't find something that kind of tickles that 
that interest, then maybe I need to look elsewhere. Yeah. Um, so it's sort of interesting that mindset shift is is shifting and that kind of ownership of, of their careers. Yeah, and I think there it's happening. Some, so some some it's happening with the individual, but it's also happening with some corporates. It's also becoming mm -hmm. a, a pretty big issue in research and talent. So some of the I'll just talk from a Hong Kong perspective. Some of the big firms in Hong Kong, um, Hong Kong multinationals, right, mm -hmm. who had that similar plan, we move, we move you here, we move you here, we move you here, are now finding that people don't want to move. Mm -hmm. I'm fine here, not going anywhere. Um, so it's, be it's becoming a huge issue for talent management, and some of the oil companies are also mm -hmm. finding it too. Mm -hmm. Challenges. Mm -hmm. You talked quite a bit about uh, the different people to have in your network. Yeah. And, and you also talked a little bit about, you know, sort of having, having those people in your network, having them as mentors. Um, and, and of course, we can have informal mentors. We don't have to be on a mentorship program, per se. Um, what do you think about sponsors? There's a lot of talk, of course, around sponsorship. And especially, you know, some people naturally end up with sponsors. Some people don't. Often it's diverse candidates that end up needing some formalized sponsorship program if they're in, inside a company. Any thoughts on that? Yeah. Do you all know the difference between sponsorship and mentors? Do you want to explain a little bit on that? Yeah, I can explain. Uh, so uh, probably a lot of you are familiar with the idea of having a mentor in the organization. It might, might be formal or it might be that you found somebody that can be a kind of advisor around political savvy perhaps in the organization and navigating the organization. A sponsor is somebody who's in your corner they're maybe looking for opportunities for you to shine. Um, they will probably try to speak you up if they have an opportunity to. So if you've done something well, they may talk to other senior people about Jane wrote, did all this research and wrote this great book. Um, so they will make sure that you get some visibility. And so they have some responsibility to help you get to the next place. But you also have some responsibility, of course, to perform and make them look good. Yep. Um, and so often what happens is people get uh, naturally might end up with a sponsor. Most people who've got into senior roles, it's usually been some of those connections and somebody that's been looking out for them or has put an opportunity their way that has given them the chance to show how great they are that's got them to the next thing. And so that would be a sponsor. And sometimes that's happening unconsciously without people deciding to con you know, to, to make sure that it's happening, but it's happening naturally. But also a lot of organizations these days may put yep. it into place some um, formalized sponsorship programs, especially perhaps for women, also for Asian leaders in some of the multinational companies. Yep. So, so that's kind of the difference on mentorship and sponsorship. So I, so I haven't had any really practical experience with it, but I've worked with a lot of firms, probably like you do, that do this, and it's worked, right? So. Um, I do know and have heard of, and I think it's been written about, Cisco Systems had a, had a sponsorship program, not only for women, but also for Asian talent, because they were a global organization, and what they realized, John Chambers, I think was the CEO, realized that we weren't, we didn't know our Asian talent. We, we, we never see yeah. them, right? And it's not that the, the Asian talent wasn't there, it's just that everybody was so busy, and so we were going to appoint sponsors for different talents. So when you go to a talent meeting, your sponsor would talk about you. So I, I have seen it has had an impact and has changed the diversity inclusion numbers or the mix inside mm -hmm. organizations. Um, but I don't ha have any, I know Credit Suisse is another one that has, uh, has, has seen a huge impact with women at Credit Suisse mm -hmm. with sponsorship. Yeah, I've seen the same thing with some of the formalized sponsorship programs. When I talk with people who um, naturally ended up with a sponsor, or even if I think of myself and people sponsored me when I was working internally, it wasn't something that we decided ahead of time. It was more like somewhere along the way I realized, aha, this person's my sponsor, yeah. or this person's sponsoring me. And when I talk with other people, they say that too, that it's more that it's somehow organically evolved and then they realized that's the relationship we have and now, now let's, let's talk about that. Let's see how we can yeah. leverage it to help each other. Yeah. So if you work in, um, there are a lot of firms that have formal sponsorship programs. Um, that might be a way to go. <laughs> it certainly helps. 
the let list yes, with you some nice yes. opportunities and yes. put some resources and support behind you. Yes. Um, and at the same time, if people are on sponsorship programs, there's no guarantee that yeah. they will be promoted or what comes next. Um, you, you still have to prove yourself, but it, it's, it's good to have a sponsor in your corner. Um, if I can change the topic a little bit, um, social media. So you talked a bit about you know who's in your network and so on, but people also <coughs> use social media, especially if we think about things like LinkedIn, um, ways of getting themselves out there, showing some social media presence, showing what they think about various, um, perhaps some professional topics or events that they're going to. Uh, I think sometimes could be great for people, sometimes they worry, is something going to backfire on them? Yeah. Um, and also we know that a lot of recruiting companies um, and internal recruiters will check people's social media presence. Yeah. Any thoughts on that? Like how do you leverage social media? Are there any things you should be careful about when it comes to, to using that for your career? Yeah. So I did a little bit of kind of trying to figure this out in Japan. Um, LinkedIn. Is LinkedIn, are you all on LinkedIn? Pretty much? Um, no? Maybe? No. Oh. Um, Facebook. Yes? Facebook you use for your careers professionally or is it family stuff? Both? Professional? Both, okay. One more. Twitter? No. Okay, so now I'm going to answer the question. So. I really do wholeheartedly believe you've got to have a social media presence. You can't get around it. Um, and I think across cultures it's different, right? So Facebook, from what I've learned of late doing a little bit of research, on it, it seems, to do, seems to resonate in Japan. I gave a talk at Twitter uh, for Twitter for Women, and they said that Twitter's huge in Japan. Right, so everybody's on Twitter in Japan. Um, LinkedIn is just the kind of a global, it's, it's kind of a global platform, but it's really where, look, look, if you want to build your career, if you want to be known, you need to have a profile, a, a, a very good profile. And there's all sorts of people that do coaching and research on this, right? The one thing that you need to figure out, and a lot of people don't do, you need to add, answer that question that I asked you in the very beginning. Who am I? What do you want to be known for? So to get, get, get to the point of when it goes wrong, if you're out there tweeting about kind of, re, you know, I went to, went to McDonald's for lunch and I'm at the airport, we don't really care, right? <laughs> um, but if you're tweeting about leadership development and cross-cultural leadership development or diversity and inclusion, oh, you must be an expert in that because you're tweeting about that. Twitter is probably the fastest way to build your brand faster than Facebook or LinkedIn. It's not for everybody. I'm a big fan of it. I tweet a lot. Um, so, but you have to have your story down. You have to, and, and I hate to use this word brand, but you've got to figure out who you are and what you want to be known for. And it's like you said earlier, think of the audience. How am I connecting with that audience? So yes, uh, if you don't want to do Twitter, it's fine. It's not for everybody. But LinkedIn, I think, is really important. And if Japan is a Facebook, if that's where Japan goes, or recruiters go, or people go, you want to connect with, then certainly you should be on face. You should be on Facebook. Um, I think they're they're really important. It's just like having your resume instead of having it on this. You've got it in cyberspace. <laughs> that's what I was trying to look for. Yeah. And using Twitter, how often? Uh, oh, okay. So I have a program for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so look, I, we're both consultants, and I think if anybody here is an entrepreneur or consultant, you really do need to be on Twitter. Although there was an interesting article, I don't know how long Twitter's going to be out there. Maybe it'll be purchased. But so here's here's an idea. If you are an entrepreneur or you're a consultant, um, I learned this from a marketing person. If you want to get started and build your brand on Twitter, you tweet 12 times a day tweet consistently 12 times a day for three months. Honestly, at the end of that three months, you will be known for whatever it is you want to be known for. Um, and it can't just be, oh, you know, leadership is interesting or leadership, cross-cultural leadership. You have to have something succinct to say that, that somebody will go, oh, that's really an interesting story. 
Tell me more about, it's, it's, Twitter is a dialogue, it's, it's a conversation, but that's the method. 12 tweets a day, three months, check back with me later and tell me, but your profile will be, you'll be known. And not only in, and you'll be known in Japan, uh, and you'll also be known in the US. Lots of Twitter followers in the US. And there's all sorts of technicals, when you should tweet, when you should not tweet. You don't need to go there. <laughs> well, people will choose when they're going to look at it anyway, yeah. right? Yeah. And so you've just touched a little bit on uh, you know, entrepreneurs, and that was something else I wanted to ask you about, because of course not everybody at Globus necessarily wants to be inside a big company. Maybe you're starting or already have your, your, own, your own enterprise. Yep. Um, so are there any things that you think are, are different when it comes to navigating your career as an entrepreneur? And I guess social media is, is a big one. Yeah. How many are entrepreneurs out here? Entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs, sort of thinking about it. Um, everything, so a lot of times I've given talks on political savvy because that was my first book, and I will have people say, oh, that's it. I'm going to quit my company and be an entrepreneur. It doesn't work that way. Politics are all around us all the time. We need to embrace it. So um, whatever we talked about here is relevant to entrepreneurship. You need to, your story is very important. Who you are and what do you deliver? And you said what you delivered. I want to do technology for education to bridge the gap. Really clear what he wants to do, right? So I know what you're offering now. You have to be really succinct on your offer. How does it impact other people? It's the same inside a company. You have to have your story down and it has to be authentic. And the connections are critically important. Um, and then the social media platform. And the other thing is your business plan. I talk to a lot of people um, who, uh, when I give talks and they say, you know, I just want to build a business to help people. Like, okay, do what? Help, help in what way? And so that story hasn't been founded. And the other thing is, okay, now that, you, Maybe, or I want to bake, I want to, I want to start a coffee shop, right? Well, what's your business plan? So the business plan is really important. So that would be the difference between career and entrepreneurs. You have to have a business plan. And I'm so surprised at really smart people that start a business and they haven't thought about a feasibility study, but you're all learning that, so you know it. Um, marketing, um, finances, none of that. It's critically important. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Thank you. Yep. Hi, uh, it's interesting when you talk about politics and your book is also like about the power of post positive workplace politics. So yeah. could you give us like kind of an advice in managing the politics in the office? Because I, I personally believe that it's very important as well. <laughs> wow, yeah. I'll, here, I'll start with like a little, um, it's about reframing what you think about politics. A lot of us, well, let me just ask. If I say the word politics, do you think positive or do you think negative? How many people think positive? <laughs> <laughs> Sitting on the fence. How many people think negative? OK, I think you need to run this class here. It's another one, storytelling and politics. Um, you need to, I would suggest you reframe your thinking on politics and the reason is this. It's part of every single competency framework at every single company. And I've worked with a lot of competency frameworks and it's either written as political savvy, political awareness, or, or, or other areas. Um, so we need first need to reframe our thinking from negative to positive. There is a bad, there is a negative side of politics, no doubt, but there's also a negative side of driving results. Like you work with somebody who's driving results and they don't care about people, there's a negative mm -hmm. side to that too. Politics is about being wise, but doing it for the good of the organization, not doing it for the good of you. That's where the negative side comes in. So reframe your thinking. And then um, the next piece is examine power inside organizations. You need to understand power and um, informal, formal power. Um, how you influence, and the network plays a huge part in that. The, the, the network piece I gave you, even though it's on careers, it actually comes out of 
the work I did in political savvy. So that's critically important. So that's my few tips on it. Reframe your thinking. Embrace it. <laughs> Can you give some examples, some positives about politics? Um, yeah, I, um, I, um, so there's, there is a bit of, there's a bit of, poli there's a piece on politics that is um, an important side of it that is important for you to have. Not all of us have it, but you can learn it. It's being intuitive, mm -hmm. being able to read the tea leaves for lack of what's going on inside a company. So I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about that. Um, at one firm I worked for, I won't mention the name, there was a competition for the head of HR. Uh, HR had a big, this is a global leader, HR had a big t a turnover. And, um, and I, had a, I worked across all these very senior people in the firm, HR leaders at different parts of the firm, right? And all of them were calling me giving me a pitch about what they did. I thought, isn't that nice? They're talking to me, why are they talking to me, right? And my boss at the time, very wise, positive, savvy, he pulled me aside and he said, why do you think those people are having those conversations with you? What's the end game? What are they trying to get out of it? And for me, I, honestly, I was a bit naive. I'm like, they're just talking to me. And he said, there's an agenda behind these conversations, so you need to take a step back and not look so trusting in everybody and find out what's, what's that agenda. Mm -hmm. And it was at that moment that the penny dropped for me. He was a very powerful uh, values-based leader and I saw that he could read what was going on inside the organization and I saw what was really happening and, um, and it was a very positive thing for him to pull me aside. And at different times in my career he'd pull me aside and say, why is that person telling you that? get beneath it, understand it. So it was, so, and it was for the good of the organization. So mm -hmm. was, mm -hmm. yeah. mm. I noticed when I, I'm um, doing leadership training with some people in Japan, they often have um, an allergic reaction to the idea of things like lobbying, yes. which is kind of what these people who wanted the HR role yes. were doing. And often we have this yeah, kind of negative reaction to that, but there can often be times where people are lobbying for something that is for the better yep. for the organization. And, and again, maybe a skill that we have to use sometimes. Definitely, lobbying is a big part of it. And um, I think that organizations, the people who have the negative view of politics and don't want to lobby, sometimes they'll leave the organization and then a great idea mm -hmm. leaves with them. Yep. So I think that's why I think we need to learn political savvy. Mm -hmm. And I've seen that a lot. There was a beautiful um, uh, Imagineer, an engineer who built rides at Disney, and he explained to me how that whole stakeholder management worked at the very senior levels. But he looked at it as building a community mm -hmm. and s selling ideas before, you sell the idea before the actual meeting takes place. And then when you get to the meeting, everybody's in agreement. And um, yeah. Yeah, which is maybe a little bit similar to Nemawashi and so on in yes. Japan too, right? Yep, we have another question. Yeah. Um, so I have, um, I'm sort of in a similar HR field and I have two questions. Uh, one is um, sort of going back to where you started it. Um, you talked about CEO, um, how this uh, women became a CEO of a uh, large brand, fashion brand. Yeah. And then I'd like to know how um, the key factors that um, you're uh, here today, where you are, uh, in terms of your uh, career ladder in, and what brought you to where you are today, but also relating to politics. My question number two is, I've also worked I've worked in Japanese company and now I work for uh, uh, sort of like a British company. And uh, I see this sort of like a ceiling in the company where uh, my boss is a Japanese female. She grew up in the US, but uh, she's, you know, a racially uh, and racially uh, Japanese um, a woman. And then um, I see this. Um, maybe politics or preference where um, um, someone external, he's also, he shares uh, the similar background to my company. He gets to have 
the higher level in the company, and、uh, my boss kind of struggles to move up in her her corporate ladder. So、uh, my so my question would be、um, lobbying、um, and playing the politics. Always, I believe, is a key factor. But at the same time, do you do you also believe in having、um, Sort of like unchangeable factors. So,、uh, for example, like where you come from,、uh, your race—not exactly race. I'm sorry, but your sort of like a, like a background.、Um, do you think that's also a key factor in moving up in a corporate ladder?、Mm. Okay. You okay with the two questions? Yeah, two questions. Yeah. So one is my career, and the second one is this political one.、Um, I actually think this political one is kind of interesting. So I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about me, but I'll answer that one first. So, if I understand it correctly, uh, uh, your boss is at one level, but there's somebody else who's at a higher level, but they're kind of the same skill set or something, right?、Um, uh, yeah, that's right. But uh,、um, this gentleman that just that、uh, recently joined our company, he、uh, he joined as a director level, and then my manager is a senior manager, so she's.、Yeah. A level below, but she has longer、uh, experience in the field, and she is well. Well, she's older, definitely,、yep. uh, than the, the this. And there was some cultural thing in there too, right? Some. Yeah. So、um, she's racially Japanese, but she was born and raised in the U.S.、Yep. So she understands the same language and like、uh, behaves more Westerner than Japanese. But at the same time, this gentleman that joined. He's British,、yeah. and、uh, and the firm's British. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Got it. Got. It. Now I got the whole thing. Okay. So、um, there's a there's so if we look at the political savvy part, you, and I said earlier, you do need to understand politics across cultures, but you also have to understand what's happening inside your firm, right? So politics is very different. I'll just I'll give you an example from. My experience, right? So Disney is a very nice, very relationship-based, no profanity, <clears throat> not a very indirect style of communication. I worked at a GE firm, exactly the opposite. Not, do you work at GE? <laughs> not necessarily. It was a very direct communication, in your face, bravado, slightly different values. One's not better than the other. Not to make a judgment, but they were culturally different. So people at Disney who moved to GE failed miserably. People at GE who went to Disney failed miserably. So you have to understand how does that organization work. So back to your situation. So typically, not gonna,、um, not going to. I don't want to make any judgments, but sometimes organizations, and we know this from working in diversity and inclusion, have a preference for. Somebody who comes from that same culture, right? So if I'm an American firm, and I, this is why I went back to school to get my doctorate, I would see people who were passed over for promotions. Wasn't that they didn't have the talent? Was there was something cultural in that? Oh, I, we all do it.、Um, people like me, I trust. The people like me syndrome, right? So what you have to have is somebody in that room who says, "No, wait a minute." How come you're not, you know, giving Suzanne that opportunity to move ahead? You know, and, and、um, how about thinking about Suzanne? That's where sponsorship and mentoring becomes important. So this is unconscious bias stuff that goes on. That's one. So you have to understand how is that? How did that person come in? What does he have the value? And and what I often find, a lot of it comes down to communication. Sometimes, and I'm, now I'm going to go down a little bit of a gender line, and I apologize. Sometimes women have a tendency to hold back. I'm not going to talk about what I do because it's just my job. Everybody knows what I'm doing. Sometimes, again, it's a gender thing. A little bit of a generalization. Sometimes men are more articulate in. Well, I've just done this, and I've just.、Um, You know, created this, and we ran this marketing campaign over here, and here's the results that we got. Even though that's just the job, so sometimes it comes down to communication and who's telling your story, talking about what you do.、Um, other times it could be preferences. Other times it could be back to that network thing. It could be who are you connected to and who's in your corner, who's going to stand up for you, who's going to say, "Now wait a minute, 
you know, she did this five years ago. And she, so it's, it's reading, it's building the network, being able to talk about what you do. Um, and then at one point, I think you have to have the conversation, help me understand I'm here, this person's here. How do I get that? And that's a bigger one to move. So it could be cultural, it could be bias, it could be communication style differences, it could be not understanding how things work here. Um, I, I just, I'll just reinforce the talking piece, right? So I worked at a company and um, uh, the marketing director was here and the CEO was over there, over there at the end. And, he, and the carpet was worn thin from the marketing director going to the CEO's office every day telling him what he did. Marketing, everybody knows what you do, right? But he would talk about how much money his marketing campaign brought to the company. Now, the research and design person who was next to him never did any of that. And when I came to the firm, who was the glowing talent, the marketing guy and the research guy, they were going, you know, maybe he should move on. So that's why this communication and network thing is, is vast, really important. Does that help with that? And maybe you can see what, maybe give her some coaching or some advice. Yeah. <laughs> or apply it to yourself and seeing what's happened for her and then the, the man that was hired in. And it could be thinking for yourself, right? Are there some biases in this organization? Yep. Or it could be something completely different, right? It could be something to do with their capabilities, track record, etc. Yep. But what can you learn from observing that? Yep. And you, you asked a question on my career, um, you know, I would say pretty serendipitous. Um, studying Spanish and business and deciding didn't want to do that. Actually, I do want to move to Spain at one point. Um, uh, I think mine was uh, being curious, uh, trying to figure out, well, why is that happening? And I was actually, I would always ask, well, why are we doing this? So. It, I was kind of the pain in everybody's side in some organization. So I think it was the why and the curiosity. And each different step led me to a different way. But I would also say to you too, one of the things that I've done is I've seen people that I really admire and I say, I'd like to be like that. And um, so I kind of find people that I think are doing some good work and I try to follow their path. That's how I didn't have a plan, I'm still, <laughs> I should have, I, I talk about having the plan, that's why. I should have had a better plan. Can you I ask? Oh, okay, so I'll... Thank you. Um, the question I want to ask goes back to your former statement about being wise and doing good for the company uh, when you talked about politics. So I wanted to um, find out from you, when do we really know when to stop when it comes to doing good for the company? Because sometimes you're trying to do good to the company, you will lose your team. You understand what I mean? Um, I've worked in institution, I, my experience, my background is four years engineering management and then four years corporate marketing. For the four years engineering marketing, I, I mean general management that I worked in, I was leading a lot of teams with different uh, uh, skill sets. But it's a final situation whereby sometimes you want to drive the goal of the organization, you want to bring up suggestions, you want to network to make sure people do things the right way. You might at the end be tagged a bad person. So what I want to find out from your experience, from coaching people, when do we really stop such that we don't go beyond the line, if like maybe tips to help us really know our boundary because doing politics is good, using it positive way to help our company, but at the same time, there are times when we stretch it, not knowing we're stretching it. That's one question I want to say. And then uh, to what she said earlier also about like the situation whereby a director comes in and he or she has uh, 18 or 15 years experience already assisting in the company and then another person comes in to stay on top. I actually faced that in my former company where I worked before. Uh, my boss that came in um, had less experience, but I also believe that he, at the end of the day, um, because of his nationality, the nature of the business required his presence to do marketing. Without his presence going to do the networking in Brussels in different countries, we will not have contracts. So sometimes it's also about what the job really requires. Like yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think we have to look at the, sometimes politics questions can be quite complicated too. So I think um, we have to look at the, many of the dynamics. Um, the thing about being politically savvy and for the organization, I'm trying to think about your question. I think it's a good one. Um, who, do you all manage teams here, teams of people? Some of you manage people? You do? One of the things that your teams are probably expecting you to be politically savvy. So there's a piece on politically, political savvy is also that you bring the team along. So it's not that you're just totally focused on the organization and driving it. Because we all know people who manage up very well, don't we? Manage like to the CEO and the senior. So you've got to bring that group along too. Um, and the, you have to be speaking about that group and sponsoring that group and helping that group and letting that group shine. If you're just solely focused on the organization and moving ahead and, all, and just connecting with a more senior powerful group, then this group becomes disengaged. Um, so I, I think, I, I, and then you have to yeah, find a way to engage them. I, I, that to me is critical. So I'm gonna answer it from a different way. There was a woman I worked with in Singapore and she got a huge marketing job. She was, it was in a television company. Brilliant marketer, really great. And she said, if you're coming here to tell me that I need to be politically savvy, you can just leave, because I'm not interested. So I said, well, what do you want to do? And she said, I want people to know that my, I can drive the business and I can be really good at it. And her, she was working in Singapore and the headquarters were in New York. Okay. And I want my team to be recognized. Okay. And then I want to have a succession plan for my team, right? That requires being connected to New York, talking about your team, self, in some sense, self and team promotion. It requires all the essence of politics. And so she was able to flip her thinking about politics by thinking that way. So I don't know if that answers your question, but you've got to always think about your team. Um, it's if, if you're seen as the person who's politicking and it's just all about up going up, you're, gonna have, you're not going to have the engagement with your team. You're not going to have the leadership of your team. I don't, I don't see it as one or the other. I see it as inclusive. Can oh. I ask? Yeah. I should be doing that to you, actually. Can I ask one quick question that's... Uh, that's maybe looking at slightly different side of things, and then we'll definitely come back to you. Um, so we've talked a lot about what the individual can do. And of course, we're all working within systems. You don't have to go into sort of like <laughs> deep analysis, but any key tips that you know, people here can think about within their own organizations, what are some of the key tips that organizations can do to support people to navigate their careers well? I think one of the simple things that organizations can do is just to start having conversations with people about their careers. And a lot of times I talk inside um, organizations and some people really think they're doing it. But I have to tell you, talking to employees, it's not happening. Um, there's beautiful data, beautiful kind of sad data, um, Gallup runs it every year about the disconnect, between, disengagement between employees and their work. Um, there's also beautiful data that came from BCG on if this is particularly looking at women. If you talk to women about their careers and engage them at a time where they need an intervention, whether they just came back from maternity leave or family or whatever, that conversation alone, women will stay at the firm much longer and be loyal. So it's just about having, and it's not about where do you want to go, where are you going, it's just about what are you doing today and what's impactful and what are your values and some of the questions that I ask. It's just having those casual conversations to learn about people. That's what I think organizations need to so do. Kind of knowing your people, having that open dialogue. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I'll come back to your question. Um, I would like to ask, is there anything you can do if somebody in your company um, who has higher power than you is kind of biased against you because of your gender or your culture, cu cultural background or just because of your personality or anything? Um, are there any tips uh, if you get into that kind of situation? That's a tough one. I have a <laughs> workshop on navigating bias, oh. um, which is exactly addressing that. 
Maybe you do can you have some that. thoughts on that? Um, the one thing, it's, it's hard, uh, may, and you should add to this too, I think on bias, um, you certainly can't confront directly on that, right? I think you're biased, I think you, you don't like women, I think you don't like cultures, right? People are going to get their backs up against the wall. I do work in unconscious bias, um, and I find a lot of times when I go into, particularly investment banks, people are like, oh, she's going to talk about bias, oh my god. Um, it, we all are biased, right? It's a natural, our natural brain function. So um, I, I think you have to step lightly if you're going to challenge that, but um, maybe have a conversation about here's my goals, here's what I want to achieve. Can you help me, give me some insights on if you think that's a possibility. Use a more coaching style on that, but I... I don't know. I think I'll leave it with you to say. I think it's actually the flip side of what you said organizations should do, sort of dialogue and know their people better. A lot of bias you mentioned that it could be about um, <coughs> about being a woman or about your ethnicity, race, etc. Maybe about age and so on. And and so the way that you can help other people get over their biases is to let them get to know you yeah. as an individual. Uh, so I, I think it's back to, to being able to dialogue. And of course, then there's a little bit that maybe parallels with the political savvy, knowing that there may be some biases about you or some group that, that you belong to, then take that into account and think about, are there some things I can do or I need to talk to a mentor or a manager or a sponsor to help me to alleviate some of the challenges I think might be in my way that might not be in somebody who's different's way. Yeah. I think one of the most powerful things to do in diversity and inclusion and in this space and unconscious bias of building these global work, workforces is um, sit back and listen to other people's mm. stories. I mean, all of you have a story to tell, which is fascinating and interesting. And I was fortunate that I interviewed said, many women across um, Asia, and every single one of them were powerful. Every single one of them could have been a leader, um, but if some of the women walked in the room today, you wouldn't you wouldn't think that. It's till you get beneath the surface and you understand the pivot points in their life and who they are and how they got to be where they are today. And this is what I think organizations need to do: is take time to listen to people's stories and bring out the individual. I think when I talk about it, not mm. not just look at <coughs> culture. Look at the positive side that all of you bring from an individual perspective. But we don't take the time to listen. Yeah. Do we have any other questions? Through your research, I wonder if you saw any differences between the, um, the challenge, uh, about the challenges that um, the Japanese women face, and um, like non-Japanese Asian women face, and maybe American women uh, do and how they kind of overcame those their challenges. Um, I'm, I'm asking this because um, I was born and raised here, and then I went to USC as oh. an exchange student. So your accent makes me uh, miss LA. And then um, I got an opportunity to work in Hong Kong for two years. And then when I talk to my friends in LA and when I talk to my ex colleagues in Hong Kong, I see a lot of um, differences um, in the topics that they. Um, like they're passionate about talking about. So um, I, I'm sure you saw some differences um, through your researches and, um, yeah. and uh, I would like to know um, where you thought um, those um, differences were coming from. Yeah, what differences have you heard in the conversations? I'm quite fascinated by that between your LA friends and your Hong Kong friends. Um, I think um, my Hong Kong friends um, kind of know and believe that they're going to keep working until they retire in um, I don't know, 60 or something. And um, I think my Japanese friend, female friends or colleagues tend to be um, the most struggling about balancing their career and their personal lives. Yeah. And my friends in LA, um, I think that they, um, they're the ones who um, talk about 
their, their overall lifestyles the most. Because one of my friends who grew up in Southern California, she moved to Chicago and she lived there for um, 10 years, I think. And then she hated the weather. So she finally moved back to San Diego. So, but I mean, none of my Hong Kong friends talk about that kind of like a geographic difference um, and where, do, where they want to live or where they want to raise their kids. Yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, coming from Southern California, it's, um, I can put your resonate with that. It's, for some reason, it's all about the weather. People may move, but they always go back, right? Um, so that's interesting. I like those three different dialogues. So here's what I found. Um, I'll t tell you some, uh, bring in some cultural differences and some stories that I heard. One of the things, hmm, one of the things I learned uh, and it could be the women I interviewed in Japan. A lot of the women that I interviewed in Japan told me to be the leader they are today, they felt the need to leave Japan and come back, right? So they felt that it was a bit of a struggle staying here to, now these are women in their 40s, right? Um, um, and I found a similar thing in Bangladesh. So have to separate from family. There was a strong family tie, but for me to be the leader I want to be, I have to leave, I have to separate. You know, you can say that it happens in every culture, but this was a pretty big move because family is very important, right? Um, and there was a fascinating difference for me between Singaporean and Malaysian women. A lot of the women I interviewed in Singapore, I would, I would ask a question like this, um, so tell me, where are you from? Where's home? I, I was trying to get at the cultural differences and cultural things. And I think culture is interesting because like you, born and raised here, but then spent time in America, then back, almost all the women I interviewed were, one was from Taiwan, spent her formative, grew up in Taiwan, went to graduate school in South Africa, worked in Nigeria, Rwanda, South Africa, then came back to China. What, what, you know, where's home for her, right? So these cultures get really mixed up. So Singapore, when I was interviewing women in Singapore, what I found is most, a lot would say, I'm Malaysian. Now you can understand that because it used to be connected, but they've been in Singapore for 30 years. So how do you separate that? I also found that Malaysian Chinese were, they felt that they had to work harder because they were Malaysian Chinese, not Singaporean. So that was an interesting time. Hong Kong Chinese were quite different in the fact that it was more family-run companies that they belonged to and worked in. And a lot of times these women, exactly like you said, working really hard, um, gonna make a lot of money and I'll retire at whatever age. A lot of these women took over family businesses because one, there was only daughters in the family or two, the sons weren't up to running the business. <laughs> um, differences between, I'll tell you the difference, I know we're gonna to come to an end here, difference between India and, India and the Philippines. So there's one question that I ask about ambition, and I write about this in my book because it was two things, actually. I asked a question about leadership and I asked a question about ambition. And when I asked, Oh, uh, there was a woman who was from Korea. She was, she went to Harvard. She was running a big film company, moved her way up, very senior. And I said, wow, you were really ambitious. And she took a giant step back and said, I find that offensive. <laughs> and I was like, really? Ambition? Why? And the word has a negative connotation in Korea. It also has a negative connotation in Vietnam. It also doesn't play so well in Singapore. So some of the words that we use across cultures that we use inside our big companies don't translate very well. In India and the Philippines, it was exactly di very different. I'm very, and in China, I'm ambitious, here's what I wanna do. So that word felt, okay. Let me just tell you about the word leadership. So I would say, tell me about your leadership style, tell me about being a leader. Um, I'm not a leader, all of them. I'm a guide, I'm a facilitator, I'm a coach, but I'm not a leader. And I asked this question to women who are running huge businesses, CEOs of hedge funds, CEOs of media companies. They didn't resonate with that word. So those are some of the cultural differences that I found. 
And I do think the conversations are different. And I think, and the issues in Japan are real. And I don't think we can deny them in the sense that women have um, a tradition and a culture of raising families. And it's been written about maybe some of the support systems in Japan that maybe are different than in other countries. So um, that was, it was fascinating to me. Did you see the difference between the way they were overcoming their challenges? Overcoming their challenges. Good question, because it gets back to your question on perfectionism, and I knew I wanted to get back there. Um, one of the things that I found, and I really, really wish all of your companies would do this, um, with every single woman I interviewed, there was, I'm going to call the word grit, perseverance. No matter what the challenge was, no matter what the barrier was, they were gonna get over it. So the woman I told you about in Taiwan who went to, went to Africa didn't speak English. What did she do? She listened to Shakespeare every single day going back and forth to school. Can you imagine what her English was like? <laughs> um, another woman, um, two of the women, uh, women in Bangladesh and a woman in Japan um, left their countries to, and it was, I'm gonna show them, I'm gonna survive. So it was this grit and perseverance. And years ago, we used to use this on leadership, leadership, leadership competencies, looking at talent. And a lot of organizations have moved away from that. And I actually think they should put it back because every single woman I interviewed overcame something just by sheer, I'm gonna show you. Thank you. Thank you all for your questions. I think we're uh, running out of time. So uh, if you have any others, I guess it's going to have to, to happen after we've uh, closed this event. Um, as uh, one person that coaches to somebody else that coaches, then some of the, the words that I've really reflected on is, uh, you know, I think every single person that I've coached, we've explored things like what are your values? What are you interested in? What are your passions? What are your strengths? What do other people tell you are your strengths? Or how do you want to be perceived? Or if you look at yourself two years from now, three years from now, how, if you reached your goals, what would that look like, etc.? I think um, hearing what you had to say today, then it really sort of reinforces for me the importance of recognizing these things about yourself and then thinking about how do you navigate? How do you find the, the path to get to what you want? Yeah. So I'd like um, to ask all of you to, to join me in thanking Jane. I'm sure um, her seminar earlier and also very in-depth answers to a lot of your questions have um, been very, very um, insightful for, for me Thank and you. for everybody here this evening. So please thank you. give your thanks to Jane.